think it's now 9.01. We should start. Um, we'll let the others join in as the program begins. Good morning to all of you and hope you are healthy and safe. I am Ayanda Minyaka, the HR lead at FEM and your host for today's Health and Safety Webinar for Construction. Thank you again for joining us. Um, as we are all watching this workshop virtually, please be sure to you know, sit upright in the correct posture and feel free to get up and stretch every 20 minutes. We welcome you and ask you to please post your questions on the chat and we'll pose them to the speakers on your behalf. Again, at FEM, we care about the quality of life for injured workers and their dependents and champion health and safety for the benefit of all policyholders and society. For now, I'd like to just quickly go through the agenda for today. We're going to have our opening and welcome by Ms. Manyonga and Debo Manyonga followed by a construction industry economic update of 2021 by Craig Lombe, as well as uh, Prof. Felides in music, which will cover the drift to practical safety failure. And finally, by a presentation by Professor John Smallwood, which will be looking at the financial dynamics relative to construction, health and safety. Without further ado, can we please welcome Ms. Debo Manyonga. Uh, thank you, Ayanda. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome everyone to our first webinar for the year. Um, I cannot just assume that everyone knows who FEM is, so I will just spend a minute or two just giving you insight into FEM. So the Federated Employers Mutual Assurance Company, also known as FEM, provides workmen's compensation cover to the uh, construction industry. We operate under license from the Department of Employment and Labor and work alongside uh, the State Compensation Fund. So if you are within the construction industry, um, you have the choice of either taking out workmen's compensation cover with FEM or with the compensation fund. Uh, and uh, we are proud to say that over 6,000 construction companies have chosen to take out their workmen's compensation cover with FEM. And this ranges from very small industry players to large players as well. Uh, and uh, we cover in excess of 300,000 employees within the construction uh, sector. And by our estimation, that should account for about half the formal uh, workforce. And our policyholders, who are effectively our owners, uh, get the benefit of our extensive knowledge and insight into workmen's compensation within the construction space. And I say that because we were uh, set up in 1936 by the construction industry. So we are, have been in this space for 85 years. And I'm sure it's fair to say that we are experts uh, within our field. If you'd like to find out more about FEM, I would invite you to please visit our website, uh, the details of which are uh, behind me. Um, and you can find out more about how we can assist you as a construction uh, industry player. Uh, and indeed, uh, you're also able to contact our offices if you'd like to, to find out more about what it is that we, that we do. Um, in terms of uh, today and the reason why we have gathered, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our three speakers for the day, um, Craig Lambo, uh, Professor Fidelis Amuzi, and Professor John Smallwood. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate the fact that they have given off their time this morning to come and shed some light and uh, insight, and I'm sure pertinent information um, across the three specific topics that they will each uh, cover. Uh, we don't take it lightly. Um, and I think the turnout that we are seeing today, we, we've got uh, almost 150 people that have already joined and I'm sure that number is going to grow as uh, we progress in the morning, is a reflection of the fact that uh, people are keen to hear what it is that you have to say. So I really thank you uh, from that perspective. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge Sayosh, um, who have uh, accredited this webinar and are providing one CB CPD uh, point uh, to attendees um, who are also members of Sayosh. So, so thank you very much uh, to them as well. 
um, similar to what Ayanda has uh, indicated early on, I'd really like to invite you to uh, sit back, um, relax, engage with the speakers, you know, use the chat and pose any questions that you might have. Um, we will try and make sure that after every speaker, we pose one or two of those questions directly to them, but they will also avail themselves to answer those questions through the chat um, as, as well. So we look forward to engaging with you throughout the morning. Um, without further ado, I won't hold up the process any further. I'll hand back to Ayanda uh, to take us through uh, the rest of the program. Thanks, Ayanda. Okay, thank you very much, Ndeboa. Our first speaker is Craig Lambe. Craig joined the Bureau of Economic Research in 2010 and, has, and he's been a senior economist since 2014. His main focus at the BR is on the, on the construction sector and he's the editor of the quarterly building uh, and construction report, co-editor of the building report uh, relating to costs and manages the BR Building Cost Information Service. Craig is also responsible for analyzing and forecasting trends and fixed investments and has extensive knowledge of the Western Cape uh, economy. Craig holds a Master's of Economics degree and a Master's of Business Administration, both from Stellenbosch University. Welcome Craig, over to you. Uh, thank you, Wayanda, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, while I, I share my screen and prep my presentation, um, let me just thank the organizers for, for inviting me to speak. You know, economists over the past few years have become associated with prophets of doom. So I'm, I'm always uh, uh, flattered in the one hand and interested if I get, if I get repeat invitations and I have uh, shared some of these views um, with the executive team on a number of occasions. Uh, it's not that we set out to be to be overly pessimistic, but but sometimes, or, or what we've seen over the past decade, has um, has been more on, on the downside by way of economic trends than on the upside. This time around, however, um, things do look a little bit different. But again, um, it's all rel uh, relative. Um, and today's discussion, or in today's discussion, I do want to touch on a number of factors, although uh, time doesn't allow me to go into, into too much, much depth on, on each of these, simply because you know, the world um, and, and the economies are, are interconnected. It's difficult to speak about the construction sector without understanding the broader context of the global and domestic macroeconomic environment. So I'm going to paint a, a picture within the time that I have, uh, which hopefully would be able to add some value by way of insight to how we how we derive our particular forecasts and what we think um, the the prospects are for the for the for the broader construction sector for this year and into next year. So uh, I do like to kick off for the global economy, and I think here or this time around it's much more relevant than in other other periods. Um, you would know, and you can see from the graph uh, that the global economy registered its deepest contraction last year um, since World War II. Um, and this was, uh, and the reasons for this uh, we are well known. Um, across the world, economies were effectively shut down to curb the spread of the uh, COVID-19 virus. Um, and with high levels of uncertainty when economies eventually decided to reopen. Um, so just from a technical perspective, the sharp drop in 2020 uh, GDP alone um, is already a lift uh, to to uh, growth or growth prospects for 24 for this year, um, just on the basis of normalization of activity or normalized um, economic activity. Um, beyond the sort of 2021 um, threshold, we are expecting growth to, to slow somewhat uh, to three and a half percent, or at least the IMF forecasts uh, growth of about three and a half percent, which is just a tad below the sort of uh, average experience over the last decade. But all in all, it does seem as though the economy is much more resilient than what we thought a year ago, um, at least by way of growth. Uh, if we had to look at the level of GDP, so in other words, you lose um, uh, or close to 4% of GDP um, and you bounce back by 6%, it still means that by way of total activity, it's, it's below pre-pandemic levels. Um, but at least there's been a sort of growth revival or there's been 
a sort of growth recovery, uh, and we expect that to be sustained into next year. It's unlikely to be enjoyed um, uh, uh, in the same magnitude or at the same pace across the world. We have seen um, that forecasts are leaning toward emerging market economies uh, recovering much more robustly than um, developing economies. And this is largely uh, a story or a US story. We've seen post the, the uh, or we've, we've seen since the middle of last year and into the beginning of this year and discussions are continuing that the US is embarking on a massive, massive stimulus program. And we found that to be one of the key reasons why some economies are going to recover faster than others. It is the magnitude of the support received both on a fiscal perspective by way of transfers from government um, and by way of monetary support. In other words, the, the sort of level of the interest rate. The other very crucial factor that we find um, by way of the, of the economic outlook is how successful is the, the vaccine rollout uh, program in individual countries um, as, a, as a reason why some countries would outperform others, largely because it is accepted by the medical community that a successful vaccine rollout program is key to achieving a sort of herd or as, as Sol Ramaphosa says, population immunity uh, sooner, sooner rather than later. Um, so, so there are a number of factors within, within countries that are going to result in sort of divergent growth over the next, over the next year, over the next two years. There are risks to this, to this outlook, and I'm not going to delve into them um, for the sake of time. This presentation will be made available to you um, uh, through, through the regular channels, um, and you would be able to engage with the graphs and the data much more closely. But for now, the one risk that I would like to highlight um, from an economic perspective, again, links to the vaccine rollout program and the success of of uh, reaching population immunity. And um, the particular example that comes to mind is India. Um, so the IMF um, has a very uh, robust forecast for growth in India this year, close to 11% uh, or, or close to the, actually 12, 13% um, for this year. And that forecast was, or this forecast was conducted in April. Since then, however, we know that uh, the Indian economy has been devastated by the third wave of, of uh, infections, um, a new mutation has, has taken hold, um, and uh, it has had or is going to have implications for the economic um, uh, uh, outcomes uh, for this year. In fact, JP Morgan, another reputable forecasting agency, just in the two months between March and now, um, has already downwardly adjusted their forecast by two percentage points. Now at 11.2%, it's still significant growth, but we are as yet not really seeing signs that the infection rates are uh, abating in India uh, at a satisfactory pace. And it's very likely that we're going to sit with a sort of uh, further downward adjustment in, in the economic outlook. But overall, the global picture is much rosier, much rosier than what we'd expected. And it does signify that economies are much more resilient than what we gave them credit for um, uh, six months, even 12 months back. And that has had a, a significant spillover effect into in asset prices and particularly commodity prices. So what I've done just for the sake of the analysis is I've looked at two commodities, one which we export quite prodigiously, which is platinum, and one which we are net importers, so bread crude oil. And I've just indexed it to um, the 1st of May last year, I've indexed it to 100. And you can see how phenomenally these graphs have grown. Um, if you look at what's been transpiring uh, with great bread crude oil prices at the moment, it's three times higher than what it was a year ago. And it overshadows the growth in the platinum price, um, but which in itself is 60% higher than where it was um, uh, 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 this time last year. So this sort of change in, in economic fortunes, this greater resilience, this increased demand, both because uh, of pent up demand, so people weren't able to spend for a long time, but coupled with that um, tremendous fiscal and monetary stimulus, all of that has 
uh, come to a head and that has lifted uh, commodity prices quite significantly. Two other commodities which are important in the sort of broader construction space, um, iron ore and steel, um, they've also uh, shown similar trends by way of prices. Massive uh, demand, infrastructure demand globally. Now, you would uh, understand why that would, would be the case in, in this sort of environment, because infrastructure investment is uh, the most politically and socially acceptable. Um, it's difficult to stimulate an economy uh, through higher public sector wages or stimulate the economy through um, a basic income grant politically than what it is to to sort of stimulate through, through social um, and economic infrastructure investment. And we have seen uh, the commodities linked to construction. We have seen those prices rise quite significantly. So, so this uh, upbeat global environment has had a tangible uh, impact on asset and commodity prices. Another sort of asset class which has which has which has benefited is is in terms of the rand exchange rate. So yeah, uh, I've just taken it from the first um, of January this year until until uh, Friday's close, and you can see that if you if you had to to draw a straight line um, through through the trend, um, you know the rand is quite volatile. So we try and look at the sort of long term trend, and you can see that it has appreciated against the US dollar uh, quite significantly. So it's been this sort of global, this this upbeat global sentiment. It's been um, commodity prices, which has been rising, at least our export commodity prices that have been rising. But at the same time, there's been some dollar weakness, especially over the last two weeks that has supported um, RAND strength. Now, this dollar weakness is also in part linked to this, this sort of fiscal stimulus um, in, in the US and, and that link is by way of what uh, is going to uh, transpire in terms of inflation and inflation which leads to less monetary support and uh, that links towards uh, its, its sort of dampening impact or lower monetary support's dampening impact on, on growth prospects. So, so it's a sort of long link, but for now, um, the RAND is enjoying quite a, a stellar month. It broke through the 14 RAND um, to the US dollar mark on Monday, which is which marks a sort of 16 month high. So, so the, the, the improved global picture has definitely had, had a positive spin offs in, in, in tangible areas for our economy, but most notably in commodity prices and um, by way of, of, of currency movements or currency developments. Moving briefly over and linking that to, to the South African economy um, and looking at our own history. So um, we, uh, relative to the rest of the world, our economy registered a much sharper contraction last year. So if the global economy contracted by four and a half percent, our contraction was in the magnitude of 7%. So it was a deeper contraction. But uh, that said, it was uh, less negative. Um, for want of a better phrase, it was less negative than what most analysts, including us, projected for, for the majority of the year. And if you had to track our sort of um, forecast during the course of last year, um, when we initially went into lockdown, when, it, when uncertainty was at its highest, we penciled in close to 10% by way of a contraction in the South African economy. Um, and the fact that we only came in at 7% is really, again, testament to, to our, our resilience. And we have been um, seeing that in some of the near-term data as well. So it's not just the global economy that has, that has shown its, its metal and has come through stronger than, than predicted. It's also been, uh, been the domestic economy. If you look at the profile just briefly, and I just want to highlight in particular what's been happening in the construction sector or what's been happening in the construction sector last year. And you can see of all the sectors in the economy, the construction sector fared the worst by way of uh, an economic contraction. So it was down um, close to 20% uh, or just upwards of 20% um, last year. To put it into context, the sector lost a fifth of its value in 12 months, effectively nine months, um, because we went into lockdown um, toward the very end of the first quarter. And that's quite a quite a difficult uh, economic environment, and it's quite a sobering economic statistic that that you know a sector which was already on the back foot 
uh, in 2018, 2019 now experienced a further, a further contraction. And if we look at uh, how this transpires from a spending side, so just a snapshot of Economics 101, this production side is, is what is made in the economy. And then we've got the expenditure side, which is uh, what's spent in the economy. And you can see, by and large, that sort of um, uh, 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 graph um, or data point third from the bottom, which is your gross fixed capital formation. In other words, your fixed investment. So it's investment in, in assets of which um, buildings and civil works would, would be classified. That sharp contraction corresponds with that that loss of activity in the construction sector last year. So it was one of the biggest uh, victims of, of what we saw uh, transpiring in the economy um, during the course of last year. And it wasn't uh, as regularly closed or shut down as, as some other uh, subsectors in the economy, most notably um, uh, beverage or uh, alcoholic beverage sales um, uh, cigarette sales, which which were closed for a much larger part of of last year than uh, the broader construction sector. I do want to mention again, uh, and this relates to our commodity prices, um, uh, that you know we've had a sort of a windfall by way of imports and exports. Um, so uh, we've been exporting by value much more than what we've been importing by value over the past. Uh, 12 months compared to what we normally do. And this is a sort of consequence of those commodity prices. Not so much uh, the, the volume of goods that we're exporting, but the value of goods that we've been exporting has, um, has risen quite uh, substantially. And that has, has been a, a sort of strong support. Now, just two steps back briefly again on the gross fixed capital formation. Um, if we are to unpack that, just a little bit further, you will see that the main culprits for the slowing investment last year or this contraction in investment last year uh, were public corporations and uh, private business enterprises. Now, in this uh, usual analysis, the private business enterprise has a much higher weighting. It's usually between 60 and 70 percent of total investment. And if you look at um, construction facets which the private sector invests in quite predominantly, it is in the residential building sector and it is in the non-residential building sector, where the slower investment or the decline in investment by state-owned enterprises has bearing is on, on construction works and, and civil construction works. Um, so, 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 both, so the full construction sector was um, was affected, but uh, for different reasons with the building sector, mainly um, dependent on your private sector investment and civil construction works, mainly dependent on public corporations. The plus idea is that we saw general government invest um, or investment by general government decline only marginally. And this was quite a major surprise. Um, uh, uh, as we were going through the forecast, we expected uh, that sort of component of investment also to suffer. But in hindsight, there were tangible investments, um, emergency investments in, in equipment, medical equipment, in temporary medical facilities, um, upgrading medical facilities, um, changing medical facilities to allow for COVID wards versus general wards. So, so those sort of investments in the healthcare sector that really um, assisted the overall investment picture from general government. Um, to highlight, though, the overall impact on, on the construction sector, as I, as I, as I unpacked in state-owned enterprises and in private business enterprises, um, you can see how these uh, various sectors fared or subsectors fared during last year. Almost 20% contraction across the board. Um, the worst performing subsector being your non-residential buildings. And again, this comes on top of sort of um, uh, uh, in excess of 10% decline registered last year. If you had to take or if you had to look at uh, the non-residential building investment, in other words, how much money spent in real terms, so in other words, adjusted for, for inflation, how much money was spent last year on non-residential building 
activity, new non-residential building activity, it's around about 40% lower than what it was at its peak in 2015, 2016. So that subsector has, has really um, sort of uh, fallen off the mat, um, for want of a better word, relative to, to the residential building sector um, and the construction work sector, which only uh, in last year, really due to very specific factors, registered those uh, sort of sharp declines or sharp uh, contractions. The good news is, and there is, is good news, is that you know, following the shock to growth in 2020, we have seen our economy, and as I mentioned, like the rest of the world, claw back um, quite nicely and quite quickly. When we started our forecast in April, when the economy first uh, shut down um, or, or a near full shutdown of the economy, we expected the value of, of economic activity and economic output to only reach its 2019 level sometime in 2024, 2025. Um, so it would have been a, a one year shock, which takes us three uh, to almost four years to recover from. Since then, and since seeing uh, the outcomes for 2020 and tracking the sort of uh, high frequency data that we've had since the start of the year, we have, uh, you know, uh, we have adjusted um, uh, our forecast or our outlook um, so that we are likely to see uh, the level of activity recover much sooner, likely toward the end of 2022. So we've brought it back or we've brought it closer by, by almost a year, just on the back of how positive the data has been. And I've taken a random sample of the high frequency data uh, on the top right and left hand side, it's, it's the sort of retail trade sales seasonally adjusted. And you can see there that February level is slammed back in fact, it's higher than what it was um, pre the pandemic. And that's a, that's a very decent recovery. Because remember, February, um, we didn't have, um, the economy was still operating under normal conditions in February last year. So, so to have the economy recover so, so robustly is really um, quite, um, quite interesting and quite positive. The same with manufacturing production. So uh, on the top right hand side, it's it's uh, a three month moving average uh, on a month on month basis. And you can see there that growth is now much better than what it was even in 2019. Um, and again, we're comparing the sort of three months um, up until the end of March last year um, with the three months up until March this year. So a period before the pandemic really struck uh, on mass um, was now, and we're already starting to see these, these sort of positive developments. Mining production also back in positive terrain in February in terms of year and year growth. Um, so um, it's, it's only a snapshot of um, the sectors in the economy, but these are painting a picture um, uh, which suggests, as I mentioned earlier, that we're going to see a sort of level recovery much sooner than, um, than um, what we predicted earlier. Um, uh, this is also supported by sentiment data. Um, so, so sentiment data is, is, is a sort of um, uh, indication of whether or not consumer or businesses want to participate in the economy in, in a meaningful way. And we can see there um, it fell significantly in line with the, with the shutdown in the economy during the second and the third quarter of last year. But since the fourth quarter, it has recovered. And now in the first quarter of this year, it's back where it was in the first quarter of last year. Now, a lot can be said about where we were in the first quarter of last year, but it's very interesting that so quickly after um, uh, uh, the sort of major hit to the economy, um, we're already seeing consumer sentiment um, uh, pick up uh, quite nicely, and we and, and and a big part of our economic recovery story is pinned to what happens with consumers. The consumer in South Africa is about seven, 60 to 70 percent of spending in the economy in, in, in an average year. So the fortunes of consumers plays an important role in the overall economic picture. And here we are much less pessimistic than we were before. You know, we realize that uh, you know. There were a number of job losses last year. Um, employees were furloughed. Um, employees took significant salary cuts. Um, but we've seen that uh, come back, at least in terms of the salary cuts and the furloughed employees, we've seen that come back much sooner than expected. On top of that, 
we have a group of consumers that saw very little, if not no change to their financial situation. In other words, they uh, kept their jobs, uh, they didn't take a salary cut, but they saved significantly by way of transport costs and other living expenses. Um, and they've also saved um, by way of, 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 of their debt burden. I mean, we saw a, a significant reduction in the, in the repo rate, which flowed through and filtered through into the prime rate. And that has been a major support uh, to spending. And we feel um, and, and we expect that we are, unlike other emerging, emerging markets, going to uh, have uh, uh, an interest rate which is lower for longer. So in many other emerging market economies, um, Turkey probably being the main example, they cut the interest rate or the benchmark interest rate to support the economy during the pandemic. But at the start of the year, some of them started gradually um, hiking interest rates uh, because of inflation fears. And we're fortunate that we haven't had any inflation scares. Um, our RAND has, has, has appreciated quite nicely. Um, and and that, has, that sort of supports the view that we're going to have a supportive monetary environment, at least for the rest of the year. And that is, is, is a big plus. Um, if you had to compare, uh, for example, uh, if you had a, a million rand mortgage uh, in, in September 2019 versus September 2020, you'd save on average about two and a half thousand rand per month. So that is cash in your pocket. Um, uh, uh, which you are able to use to sort of stimulate um, uh, to stimulate the economy, and we have seen that come through um, quite um, quite nicely. Other sort of of positive developments, and yeah, I'm moving much closer to the construction sector. Is we have seen the sort of uh, uh, unexpected rise rise in house prices. Um, at the moment, the FNB um, house price index for February sits about 4.6%. So it was last year um, at, in, in May or middle of 2017. Um, so it's about four years ago that we've seen house prices accelerate um, at, this, at this pace. And it is a case of steadily improving demand. Now, this is a macroeconomic estimate. And it does hide things such as house sizes, um, suburbs and regions. So this is a sort of average of the economy. You would have some suburbs where house prices are growing at 10% and others where house prices are remaining um, static. Um, but for the economy as a whole, um, what this signifies is an improving residential market. Um, it's not a case of a shortage of supply, which is one of the other reasons house prices would increase, but it has been um, increased demand increased demand related to the lower interest rate environment, which has particularly supported first time buyers. Um, and that is, that is usually a, a precursor to more residential investment. So, uh, or more residential building. So if house prices start to rise, then, uh, you know, the, the argument or the economic argument is the shrewd investor would start building to, to uh, capture the sort of houses uh, or increase in house prices um, and higher house price environment that, they, that they're saddled with. The complication, however, in this time or, or this time around is that we are having or we're experiencing higher house prices at the expense of the sort of buy to let market. So many first time buyers are entering the market as owners and they're no longer tenants. And the graph on the sort of bottom left hand side just indicates the national average vacancy rates for flats. And that you can see since um, the beginning of uh, last year went from just under seven and a half percent. So in other words, seven and a half percent of available stock to rent um, was available and it edged up or it jumped to about close to 13 percent um, uh, in the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, and that does, um, uh, you know, it does argue against uh, the sort of robustness in the, in the buy to let market. So what we've seen transpire is that in order to keep tenants or in order to attract tenants, we've, had, we've seen landlords um, uh, 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 bring down the sort of escalations that they typically used to, in some cases, even slash 
um, the, the rental rate. So it was 7,000 Rand this time last year. It's now sitting at 6,500 Rand. But you'd rather have that than sit with a, a flat that is untenanted. Um, so you'd rather make some money than, than no money at all. Um, and eventually, the sort of reasoning goes, eventually you reach a point where it just makes more sense to offload the sort of, um, uh, the sort of uh, land or the sort of um, uh, property that you own. And that dynamic, again, works itself into the house price index, um, where we then start to see a, a rise in stocks. Um, we are not making that call as is, but we do think that the factors are only marginally in favor of new building. Um, so if you have to factor in this new demand, but then you have to factor in the lower demand for the sort of buy to let market or, or for uh, uh, investing in the residential property sector. Those are only marginally in favor of, of new building activity um, uh, where against a, a, a sort of period where you had both rising house prices and you had low vacancy rates, which allow uh, investors to or allow landlords to really push through um, 5, 10, 15 percent um, uh, rental escalation. That would be the sort of ideal spot to, to sort of ignite new residential investment um, on mass, um, we are not really at that at that point at the moment, and the sort of high vacancy rates argues against us reaching that sort of level um, in, in in this year or even even into next year. Um, so while these factors are are slightly in favour of new residential investment for the commercial sector, um, unfortunately, it's it is dire straits. Um, the graph shows just offers vacancy rates, um, both the CBD vacancy rate and the decentralized vacancy rate as calculated by Roda and Associates. And you can see there both lines trending up um, since, since the beginning of 2020, setting at close to about 13%, uh, a 13 percent vacancy rate, which is significantly above that sort of average level indicated by that green graph. At this sort of level of vacancy rates, there's no incentive uh, to invest in in new office space or new office stock. In fact, we have seen, like in the residential sector, um, that that sort of escalations have, have risen quite uh, or have declined quite noticeably. In fact, again, um, either zero on average or sitting marginally in negative territory. Um, this is all to prevent um, uh, uh, those particular um, office stands from, from, from remaining empty. It's not a call on a rise in remote workers or a rise in work from home. I think it was, there were many calls for that before um, the, the economic shutdowns or there were many employees who would have favored such a work environment. But I think having been through it and now having some actual data, the audience is a little bit more mixed as to whether it's going to be the default and whether or not we're going to sit with a hybrid work environment. Um, so somewhere in between being at an office full time and being or, or being able to work from home or remotely uh, full time. Uh, so that does that doesn't mean we're going to go to the level of occupancy we had before, but it it also suggests that we're not going to be sustained at these levels of of vacancy rates um, at least over the medium term. For now, however, there is very little incentive for office space or new office space development, um, simply because there's already so much stock available and so much stock available at, at a cheaper and cheaper rate per square meter um, as uh, tenants or as landlords aggressively try to uh, try to attack the attract the tenants that are that are available. Um, just to summarize by way of building plans passed for the residential and the non-residential sector to highlight again, mainly this time, the discrepancy between the performance of the residential sector and non-residential sector. I've compared the three months to February of this year to the three months of February last year to try and get a view uh, of a sort of pre-pandemic view. And there's definitely much more appetite in the residential sector. Um, 
uh, you'll see that both in the sort of medium sized homes, so greater or equal to 80 square meters, and you see it in the in the sort of investment by flats and townhouses. And it is quite a significant improvement um, uh, between the two periods that I that I compare. And so that in other words, that gray bar graph is much higher than the than the comparative blue bar graph. Not so for the non residential sector. In fact, you would find that it is significantly lower. Um, the levels are lower versus residential investment to start with, but compared to its own performance up until February last year, there's just nothing coming through in office and banking space and really nothing coming through in terms of shopping space where there are where there is some activity is in the sort of industrial and warehouse space um, driven by you know online shopping. By, by increased sort of logistical features, um, increased um, storage space. Um, uh, 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 so, so that has sort of tangible legs, but in terms of office and shopping space, it is likely to be once again, a very, very difficult year. What is also interesting is the rise in additions and alterations for dwelling homes. One part of that is, again, the work from home phenomenon. So you make your space a little bit more amenable. You put a partition in to separate your office from your living room, or uh, you add a new section onto your home that would become an office or a second room. Um, and then, then also you, you sit at home every day and you, you look at the little ragged tile and you look at the sort of um, unpleasant color on your walls um, and and you know you you actually have a little bit more time and more motivation to really uh, to really get it done i mean i've I had to do quite a bit of painting at home it's it's my wife that now sees these things uh, and i don't have an excuse not to do them so so it is it is there are some legs to this to this um, additions and alterations and and retail hardware sales uh, slash DIY aspect, which has come through um, quite predominantly. In fact, if you look at that retail sales figures I discussed earlier, the best performer over the last three to four months, um, in fact, probably the last two quarters, has been hardware paint and glass sales. It's just really done phenomenally well, phenomenally better than other spending categories um, over the past over the past while. Looking a bit at the at the public sector capex plans, and I'm not going to delve into this uh, too much. Two things that I want to say, despite the increased focus on infrastructure by way of of, of speeches and dialogues, um, the actual capex budgets have been shrinking um, for the past few years. Um, Nine hundred and fifty billion was budgeted for in the 2017 medium term. Uh, uh, policy frameworks. In other words, the coming three fiscal years. In February, that budget was only 791 billion. Now, this is in in nominal terms, so it's not adjusted for inflation. If we had to just adjust this for inflation, we would sit with a much lower figure than 791 rand um, or 91 billion rand worth of worth of infra or, or capex expenditure. Um, if you look at the distribution, so, so that's the one aspect. The one aspect is that the budget is declining. The second aspect is that where the budget sits is, 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 is in a space where there's, there's very little faith at this stage. So you'll see that a large part of the budget, um, uh, close to 40% of the budget is in the hands of state-owned companies or, or in, in the hands of public corporations. We know from history that typically state-owned enterprises are only able to spend uh, uh, about 60% of their capex allocation in a good year, in an average year. Um, so, so while we're glad that there's still money being set aside for infrastructure, we, are, we or I am very wary about whether or not that close to 300 billion allocated to state-owned companies is actually going to be spent um, over the three-year horizon. We could sit with something much closer to 200,000, um, but then, you know, how much 
more would the economy have benefited and the construction sector have benefited from that additional 93.7 billion. And I say this in light of um, expenditure by national departments, which is a much smaller piece of the pie, and provincial departments, again, a smaller piece of the pie than, than state enterprises. Those two entities spend exceptionally well on their budget. And in an average year, it would be somewhere in the order of about 90% um, of their budget spent, um, which is a very good sort of measure of efficiency. Yet, <coughs> apologies, yet uh, the bulk of the capex allocation rests in the hands of state-owned enterprises. Um, to their credit, and to the credit of some state-owned enterprises, we are seeing some work come through. We know recently um, one of the listed construction firms um, uh, uh, was, was, was optimistic about the state of the order books and the state of work that's coming through. And a lot of that is in the roads construction sector. Um, it's Sunral that, that, that is, is um, in my opinion, one of the, the more efficient state-owned enterprises. Um, but then there's also provincial roads. And we know provinces, provinces um, they've been spending on their capex allocations. I can't account for where the spending goes. I'm assuming it goes to the projects that are budgeted for, but there are some winds creeping through in the sort of broader uh, public sector um, infrastructure space. It is, uh, I do say this, um, knowing that we have other infrastructure programs in the pipeline and other methodologies through which we would like to get infrastructure investment off the ground. And these are phenomenally big numbers being touted. And again, I, I don't believe, I, or I do believe that infrastructure is a focus of um, the, the, the ruling party and a focus of the uh, uh, political um, and, and um, government leaders, you know, but we, we are a little bit uh, hesitant. I mean, we've we heard this, this rhetoric and this dialogue before, um, and we want to first see this come through by way of tangible work before we say, but wait a minute, this is really something that's going to um, uh, 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 ignite uh, sort of uh, the construction sector and ignite and have sort of positive benefits to the broader economy. So to summarize, just so I'm not going to talk too much about the fiscal environment. I think um, the key takeaway here is that we're sitting in a much better fiscal position than what we believed we would be at um, this time last year, um, to such an extent that, uh, you know, last week, uh, Moody's decided uh, not to go ahead with the, with the, with the ratings review as, as planned. Um, they didn't really embellish that it's because um, there's a, a sort of better fiscal position at play. But if we were in a worse fiscal position than what we had thought um, uh, six months ago, 12 months ago, they would have gone ahead with that review. Um, so, so that does say something about how we've been able to manage our fiscus. We've seen uh, tax revenue come in much better than what we thought. Um, we've been able to consolidate expenditure. Um, but the important uh, key or the key development is how we are progressing on public sector wage bill. And there have been some analysts that um, suggest that we will are unable, we will be unable to push through what is effectively a public sector wage, wage freeze over the next three years. Um, however, we've been able to toe the line. There've been there've been moments where we thought, but okay, we've, we've, we are losing the plot a little bit. But up until now, um, there hasn't been any major backlash, and it's now what two three months after the budget speech. Um, uh, uh, and and a full year since we 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 didn't uh, uh, fulfill the sort of last last part of the uh, uh, previous wage agreement. So those are those are important developments, and those are uh, definitely adding to the broader optimism that that uh, around the South African fiscal situation and the South African economic situation that that the that the high frequency data um, uh, has has pointed to. Overall. Um, I think um, uh, by way of economic growth, and this is again trying to, to squeeze many ideas onto one page um, and many sort of thought processes on one page. But what I want to highlight is that we are 
expect our economy to bounce back um, quite nicely from the 7% contraction um, registered uh, last year. Key to that is what's happening with consumer spending. And I mentioned the support of monetary environment. I've mentioned a return to um, normal salary increases, a return to uh, or a return of some of the jobs that we lost during the course of last year. And that should um, buoy the economy uh, quite nicely. Where we're also expecting to fare relatively well is in terms of our uh, import and export profile. So you'll see there, we've got a, two terms there, gross domestic expenditure, um, which, is, which is all the expenditure um, locally or, or by locals. And then the real GDP figure is ultimately looking at our domestic expenditure, but also our relationship uh, by way of foreign trade um, in goods and services with the rest of the world. And there, our supportive, or there the support of commodity prices come through quite nicely. And we are expecting it to be sustained. Um, we don't expect it to grow by the same amount that we saw in the recent past, but we do not feel that uh, a, a, a slowdown is, is, is imminent, uh, although uh, that is the average view uh, for, on a day-to-day -day basis, we could see um, uh, very volatile commodity prices, but on average for the year, we see it to be more or less sustained at the higher level we saw toward the end of last year. Uh, and that does feature in, 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 our, in our sort of real GDP estimates. What is of relevance to the construction sector, of course, is the fixed investment profile. And we are not yet convinced that overall private sector fixed investment is going to rise um, uh, into this year, despite uh, it coming off a very low base, that 19.3% that contraction last year. Um, we still face the same sort of constraints that we faced pre the pandemic. We may have, uh, the, the contraction was exacerbated by the, the closure or the, the near total closure of the economy, but it's not as though we, we were sitting with very favorable conditions. And I mentioned things such as a political uncertainty, which, which was present before the pandemic. It's, it's low business confidence. Again, it existed before the pandemic. Um, uh, concerns about uh, energy uh, supply um, and stable energy supply. Again, uh, businesses are faced with that reality, but it is a reality that prevailed even before um, the, the, the economy shut down um, during the middle of last year. So those factors are still likely to weigh on private sector um, fixed investment, though, although the, the residential picture looks somewhat different. For the public sector, now here again, a large part of this investment goes to uh, the sort of civil uh, works or construction works subcomponent. There, uh, I think it, it is the, the recovery in investment by state-owned enterprises is, 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 is important. And I mentioned this uh, this word recovery again in terms of a growth recovery. So it fell by 20, 25% last year. And then we do expect it to rebound, but it's merely a normalization. Um, we do not feel that there is going to be a, a level recovery um, over our medium term forecast. So in other words, up until 2025, it's unlikely that infrastructure or investment by state-owned enterprises is going to be um, at the same level it was um, toward the end of 2019. Um, in that same breath, we do expect private sector fixed investment over the medium term. So outside of this year and next year, um, but in the sort of 2023 horizon, we expect that to fare significantly better on the back of, of structural reform, on the back of um, the, the sort of renewable energy program that we think is, is, is growing legs and that we've seen in previous rounds uh, contributing quite significantly to, uh, to economic outcomes. Perfect. Thanks, Craig. We're going a little bit long. Have you, can you wrap up? And there are this one is, or two questions for you. Thanks so much, uh, Ghez. So this is just our view on, on the sort of subcomponents. And you'll see there, we do expect um, the non-residential sector to continue struggling into this year. And I've unpacked those, those factors, but the residential and construction works, um, those subcomponents are expected to, to improve mildly. Um, but yeah, the risk got to the upside. 
you know, the risk is that we are too conservative in this particular environment, um, uh, rather than us being too optimistic, saying, well, um, it's going to grow at, 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 at uh, three, four um, percent, but it's a likelihood that it would contract by three, four percent. We're saying it can grow by three, four percent and has potential to grow further. Um, and we are tracking the data to see which direction this goes. Um, I want to, to highlight uh, just one last thing, Chase, before I, before I close. And that's just what we're seeing by way of input constraints. So we, in two of our surveys, ask uh, contractors if building material supplies, uh, if there's a shortage and the higher the level of the index, it suggests that there is a shortage. And you can see how that, is, how that has ratcheted up um, over the past uh, over the past two quarters. Um, so while we're sitting with a weak building environment, we're sitting with input costs, which are likely to rise significantly uh, because the supply of those materials um, is becoming, uh, becoming scarcer. Thank you so much, Ghez. Um, I will take those uh, questions um, quickly. Okay. Um the first question that has been posted is what is the biggest risk that we uh, that we face to economic recovery and the second question is there any data or comments regarding small businesses uh, thank you so much um, uh, ayanda um, i think for the for the for the foreseeable future for the next three or four months at least for the remainder of this year, I think the biggest risk is how much traction we get with our vaccine rollout. Um, we've seen other economies go back into hard lockdowns when infection rates rise, and Europe is a key example of that. In the fourth quarter of last year, the European economy grew phenomenally, and then cases started to rise in, in Germany and the Netherlands and, and Italy and Spain, and the economy went back into, into lockdown and is expected to, again, contract in the, in the first quarter of this year. And we are, we're definitely faced with that, with that reality. Um, over the longer term, I think um, the, 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 the fiscal dynamics uh, need, to be, need to be monitored. The sort of fiscal environment does inform um, uh, the, the ability of, of, of the state to really uh, sort of support the economy in other ways. The fiscal reality um, would, would need to be supportive if we want to get structural reform off the ground, if we want to get infrastructure off the ground. We need to ensure that we've got a stable fiscal environment uh, in, order to, in order to do so. So I think there, um, over the medium term, that is, is probably the one, um, uh, the one to watch. Uh, in terms of small businesses, this is a little bit difficult. There's not much data on small businesses per se. Um, it really is, is sector specific. And I think here, um, if you look at small businesses within, within the construction sector, we can look at, um, let's say, CADB uh, grading from one to five or six. Um, so I do think that, that the outlook for small builders at really the lower level um, is 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 a little bit more upbeat simply because of the additions and alterations market. I wouldn't go as far as calling all of all of them bucky builders, but I think there has been increased um, activity. I've got a, a contractor, a small contractor that I use to uh, to do um, jobs around around the house, um, and I'm now on a waiting list um, for, for 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 and he tells me when he's available. Um, two years ago, I would just pick up the phone and say, listen, can you come Wednesday or Thursday? So there's, there's, there's really on the bottom end or the, the really smaller end, there's, 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 there's some life um, linked to work from home, linked to being at home. Um, and these are individuals who have a sort of spare cash. They couldn't travel overseas. So they've now plowed that money into, into renovations and, and additions and alterations. In the middle end, I think, um, the growth is a little bit more constrained if you, if you particularly look at um, uh, the infrastructure budget, for example, and that a large part of that is being siphoned through the state-owned enterprises and are usually sort of bulk infrastructure, big projects. The smaller portion um, is dedicated to your provinces and your municipalities where uh, your sort of grade four, five, six would play. Um, there, the growth isn't um, uh, uh, as, as notable um, uh, but I think there are, at least there isn't, there's more efficiencies there. 
um, and we don't expect it to decline, but it's unlikely to rise as significantly as, um, as what you would see under the really small uh, building sector. Thank you so much, Craig. Uh, we are running a little over. So uh, they can, you, you can continue to post your questions in the chat and we'll ensure that we go back to them and give you written responses if you can't take them during the webinar. Without wasting any time, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Felides Imuse. Uh, he's a PhD professor and head of department at the built environment at the Central University of Free State in South Africa. Lean construction, health and safety, and well-being and, and sustainability constitute the primary research interest of Dr. Emuse, who is a research national, uh, research, national Research Foundation C-rated researcher, and he has published over 250 research outputs and received 25 awards and eight recognitions in the last eight years. Uh, Dr. Emuse is the editor of the following, Value and Waste in Lean Construction, Valuing People in Construction, and co-editor of Construction, Health and Safety in Developing Countries, which were published by Routledge. Dr. Emuse authored the Construction Safety Handbook of South Africa in 2020, uh, which was published by Sun Media in three languages, in English, Sesotho, Afrikaans, and furthermore, he's a member of the editorial advisory board of international journals, including the ISI index proceedings of the Institute of Civil Engineering Municipal Engineers. He's a member of the Association of Researchers in Construction Management, a member of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and the board of directors of Engineering Project Production Management Association. He has mentored over 30 masters and doctorate graduates and three postdoctoral fellows with diplomas and degrees spanning multiple disciplines, civil engineering, construction management, and higher education. Dr. Amusa proposed and led the development of nine accredited university qualifications within South Africa. Dr. Amusa is an international coordinator for CIB W123 People in Construction uh, Working Commission. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Amusa. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the fascinating introduction. In the interest of time, I'll just move through uh, the presentation quickly so that I can have time for one or two um, questions. This morning, we'll be talking about drift to particle safety failure uh, within the context of earth and safety management. Given the, 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 the kind of delegate we have, we all understand that managing health and safety and well-being is not exempted from how our human mind works, how we think. The human mind is perhaps one of the wonderful machines created by God. So the, dyna the dynamic nature of human mind contributes to accidental events, either directly or indirectly. In particular, an intentional cause of event is shaped by what people do on site, in construction, either as a building site or civil engineering site. What people do also either trigger an accidental flow of events or alter the flow of safe work procedures on the construction site. So the management of health and safety depends on the control measures that we can put in place on a particular site as contractors or the site management staff. So control of activities also, risk control in construction, which is also, uh, um, which also depend on risk management as it were, is also in a state of change, constant change. Why? Because of the nature of construction, where uh, activity has to be modified, Perhaps due to no availability of a particular personnel or expertise or a particular material. So, risk control must still go on despite those changes. Frontline workers, people in construction, people that have foot on the ground working on site, just as our, uh, Craig have mentioned, you also have self employed people having more jobs now because people are working more from homes and there are quite a number of occupations going on. So, such workers can also, can also oftentimes, based on my personal experience working in the industry, deviate from work as 
imagined. When people encounter what they have not planned for, they develop work around to get the job done. Okay? Deviation that occurs is synonymous with violation of safe working procedures. And violation of safe working procedures starts with it, start a slow drift into failure, a slow drift into practical failure, which eventually ends in a, in, in a missile or catastrophe. Slow drift occurs over a certain time. That is, the time is what we call the incubation period, where small incremental changes, negative changes there is, uh, that are not taken to cognizance, can lead to accidents, injuries, and fatalities. So each step is unnoticed until it is too late during the incubation period. And don't think uh, uh, people are malicious on site. That's why they, they perpetrate a practical failure or there's a slow drift. No, rather we must understand that regular people could deviate from safe work procedures due to work pressures. So if we look at this human failure diagram, it, it, it indicates to us clearly that from the human mind, if it's not, if it's not, uh, uh, if it's not trained to undo the work environment and work pressure, errors and violations can occur. An error can be either skill based or mistakes. Mistakes are often rule based mistakes, meaning you 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 know the rules but you deviated or knowledge based mistakes. Uh, you you don't know it. Then the one that is very quite common is skill based uh, errors. Okay, lapses in memory. Then violations, which really is, is, is closely linked to practical failure. Can be routine, something that occurred quite often, or can be situational because there's a change in the, in the work environment or there's a change in the materials that you have on site. Whether you want to pour a slab, there's a change in who is doing the steel fixing, for example. Then you decide to take a shortcut or you can be exceptional. So the question it is uh, that I have for every one of us this morning is, is the human mind at work in this diagram that I've just yeah, explained? Is it at work? So from my, from my own personal experience in working in the industry from 2002, 2003, I think the human mind is at work. If you look at this uh, uh, short clip that's available on, on, on YouTube, you, everyone can see it. We can see that people in construction, if care is not taken, they can, they can, they are exposed to harm. And not just the people, even the employers, we have different kind of experiences. So that that are unpalatable, that have implication for performance of the project and performance and profitability, apart from the fact that people can be injured. So in a nutshell, a drift into failure is a greater decline in safe work procedures on site. The decline in safe work procedure is driven by workplace factors, quite a number of factors, which include safety violations on construction sites. We are focusing on safety violations today, not, uh, not error, not human error. So with the data I will, I will present in the next few, few, few minutes, in the next 10, 15 minutes, where we were from an inductive research through interviews, face-to-face -face interview in the central region of, 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 of the country, meaning Bloomfontein, Kimberley, et cetera. And they were collected on site, right there on site, so that we are sure that we are talking to the right people with our insight into, into what we were asking. And these are the questions that were asked. I'm not going into it, but you look at the themes of the questions. Number one thing, was able to group together responses to questions that addresses how the, the respondent understand ETA safety violations on site. Then how artisans also see it while addressed. And you have all these, all these questions. You can go through them when you get the slide that will be shared to everyone. So let's see one of the first results. One of, one of the first results, and this is a quotation, from the study, 
the, 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 the interview noted that the main factor that causes accident on site is when both employer and the employees do not follow or rather neglect the health and safety rules and regulations. We all know we have got Constitutional Regulation 20, 2014. But despite the existence, people don't follow it. Some out of ignorance, the reason why we why I wrote the pocket book, the Constitutional Safety Pocket Book that was published last year in multiple languages. Then the quote say continue to say deliberately neglecting said safety procedures endangers every personnel on site, not just the perpetrator, even the co-workers and the public at times, especially when you leave excavations unattended. The other factors may be may be taking shortcuts when doing an assigned job. Shortcuts are taken on the job are no shortcut. They are nearly increasing the risk of injury or worse, death. In other words, this person is talking from a site wherein is a, a, a poor safety culture may be evident. So one needs to build a stronger safety culture to address some of the points that the interview flagged here. And let's quickly look at what is safety culture. It's essentially an element of a safe and productive workplace. Some people say culture is the way we do things around here. Culture encompasses our attitude, beliefs, and values and norms to work in this particular construction site or in this particular organization. Okay? A safety culture shows the commitment of everyone, both workers and employers, to enter safety at all levels, from the strategic to the site, to the site level, on site, to, to enter safety. It is when you have a, a good safety culture, you have a direct opposite of a blame culture, a figure pointing or a, a culture where in when something goes wrong, you are looking for one uncle or one general worker to blame. And when you have a blame culture, you are more or less perpetrating situation where in errors and violation and ideas a practical due to failure are ignored or hidden because nobody wants to be fingered as the bad apple on that construction site. So when you have a good safety culture, you have good and safety performance. And because of the interdependence between project performance, you have good quality performance, good time performance, and good cost performance on that project. You have things that you can use to, to flag if you have safety culture on the site. You have eight core elements, management commitment to it and safety and well-being. You have job satisfaction by the people working there. You have ongoing training that is contextualized. You have organizational commitment to health and safety, worker involvement. The workers will be motivated to support the safety initiative. You have performance management, and there will be accountability. And you can't have accountability without responsibility for safety, for the health and safety of everyone on that side. And these are the indicators. You have safety leadership. You have safety communication that is effective, motivation that I mentioned earlier on, continuous improvement through learning, and zero, as much as possible, zero blame culture. No finger pointing on that particular side. Also, you can measure your safety culture because whatever cannot be measured cannot be improved. If you are moving in the right direction through specific action taken by workers and management on that particular site, on their company, specific events. Even if it's a near miss, you can you, you will be able to decode if you have the right safety culture. And of course, specific data. So you have the second result from that study that we, we are showing. Yeah, the question that was asked is, do workload and pressure influence the extent of safety violations on site? That was the question. And we see a range of responses that were in affirmation. The first one says, yes, arrogance and carelessness are causing work pressure to produce more, thus violating safety rules. In other words, they are violating construction regulations. The, another, one, another interview he says, yes, it is common to express violations when the work is behind schedule and some safety compliance takes time, 
which the contractor may not have, especially if the contractor is self-employed contractor with less than five workers, he needs to get the job done. Another comment says, tight deadline creates a perfect environment for accidents. This is flagging fast track construction, construction or excessive use of overtime. On safe art and fuel safety checks often accompany such accidents, you know. A lot, this, that is the response to the next, to the, by another person, because supervisors and artisans or crew chiefs are violating safety measures due to taking shortcuts and leaving materials recklessly. This fellow is also flagging for housekeeping. The last comment on this slide says, yes, they do. If workers are overworked and they are tired, they tend to take shortcuts, and shortcuts at the workplace are a safety violation, which may lead to accident or incident. Every one of these things have gravity. Okay, the gravity of the influence of work pressure on safety is already flagged by all these comments by different people on different sides. And the effect of small changes could also lead to big events. What do I refer to as big event here? Accident that will lead to minor injuries or permanent injuries or fatalities in extreme cases. For some of us that may be keen, we can read the book by Sidney Decker on Drift into Failure. And you will note that there are features of drift to failure, scarcity and competition, decrementalism, which is small steps, which is what we are, we are really amplifying on, on today. Small steps on site can lead to safety failure. So if you look at this diagram, this diagram technically seeks to reverse a drift into practical failure. We have the government at the top that creates the laws, the legislation that leads to construction regulations. And as a company contractor or construction firm, we have policies in place that the management, site management, so to say, we have to adhere to the plans, safety planning, and the staff will have to action those things. And when there is deviation, those things must be recorded through observation. You collect the data, you send it up so that Safety reviews can be done, and if there's a need, there have to be some form of new legislation to close the gap. So this paper that, that we uh, uh, presented this morning conceptually argues that against work pressure that lead to safety violation. And I believe if we are to be very, very uh, honest with ourselves, for somebody that expresses myself, what there are work pressures on site, and when it occurs, we tend to take shortcuts or safety violations. So violations move construction practices incrementally, not at once, towards the edge of safety boundaries, which is what this slide is about. This is what this slide is flagging. If you start from the from uh, one of three, if the system exceeds acceptable workload, the production body on resources have severe effects. When you have unacceptable workload, you have shortcuts, you have fatigue on people, then management pressure because of efficiency, you begin to push the safety boundaries. But if the next, the next diagram talked about acceptable safety performance plan, can move in, it talked about if the system reduces output, you lessen the load, then you are looking at economic bankruptcy. Reflecting upon what Craig was presenting before this particular presentation. So, and if the system moves in the direction of higher risk, accidents will occur. And before accident occurs, you will have seen that there will be a normalization of safe, safe work procedure violations. So all this has to be avoided in, by contractors. So the illustrated space of possibility concerning deep into safety failure must be noted so that we avoid drift to failure. Conclusion, I have in the next five minutes now so that we have time for one or two questions. We have found through this study that site operatives, everyone on site perpetrates safety violations in South African construction, fatigue, substance abuse, negligence, unidentified, unidentified hazard, that's why it's good for construction workers to be hazard wise and risk-wise, they need to know 
what constitutes hazard and what is a risk. And work pressure all leads to safety violations. They cause safety violations. They help workers to, 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 to perpetrate it. The work pressure that supervisors exert on artisans and general workers ignites. In other words, it starts a drift into failure, practical failure. So this paper support the proposition of the model I presented just a short while ago, in the sense that small compromises and adaptations can accumulate over time during the incubation period to create situations that erode safety on the construction site. The argument is that if there were no countermeasures to the normalization of safe work procedures violation, safe systems, systems that are otherwise safe, would drift through practical failure, which is another word for practical failure is accident. Okay? Factors of drift into failure and the normalization of safety violations are related to work pressure. You cannot really separate these factors. So work pressures override health and safety concerns, and it leads to incremental tolerance for shortcuts, which can improve or maintain productivity in the short term, but in the long term, it is very dangerous. So site operators must be aware of and avoid these factors with the support of management. They can't do it alone. They need to have a voice. They need to be able to, to, to express their, their concerns when they're being asked to do what is not correct on site. Contractors also, if there is any around here, and health and safety officers, must discourage shortcut on project site. Okay? They have to implement practical measures that give safety an active voice. I said it just a few seconds ago on site to limit drift into failure. Site management must be allowed to repeated failure on site to, uh, to address the normalization of safe work procedures, violations. I would really want to thank everyone for listening this morning. Thank you. Over to you, Chair. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, we do have one question from you in the channel. Uh, from experience, some incidents are as a result of uninformed suppliers that present uh, hazards when they arrive on site for delivery. Could it be possible for long-term suppliers to capacitate themselves internally from their companies by liaising with their clients and learn more about um, potential hazards before they arrive? when they visit different sites during delivery? Thank you very much. You, you, you asked the question, you provided the answer. Because <laughs> to, to be honest, when we are addressing hazard and risk, we start from the source. So that they have to build capacity before they actually come to site. And if such a thing is, is flagged on site by the health and safety officer or representative, it should not be overlooked as well. It should be recorded and addressed appropriately. Any mm -hmm. other question? Um, there's no other questions that have come through. Uh, yes, I see your hand. That's just applause. And from some of the guys in the chat saying, thank you, Prof, very nice presentation. Uh, there is nothing else in the chat at the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, we'll then move over to our next speaker, Professor John Smallwood. Just, okay. I'd like to do the introduction of our next speaker. Uh, professor John Smallwood is a professor in construction management in the Department of Construction Management at the Nelson Mandela University uh, in South Africa and the principal construction research, education and training uh, enterprises. Both his MCSC and PhD construction management address construction health and safety. He has conducted extensive research and published in areas of construction health and safety, ergonomics and occupational health, but also in areas of environmental health and well-being and primary health promotion, quality management and risk management. Uh, without wasting any further time, I'd like to hand over to you, Professor John Small. Thank you.
just to double check, uh, Prof Smallwood, are you going to have your video on? Ah, there we go. Thank you. Can you hear me, Chair? Uh, oh, thanks, Leah. Can you hear me, Chair? Very clearly. Thank you, Prof. Right. Uh, thank you to FEM for this opportunity to address this virtual HS workshop for the construction industry. The financial dynamics relative to construction, health and safety, I probably could have added the financial mechanics and dynamics, but nevertheless, without any further ado, a number of issues, the cost of accidents, COA hereafter, it's uh, constituted by the direct and the indirect costs. There's the contribution of the COA to the cost of construction. There, of course, is synergy between health and safety and the other project parameters. There's a negative synergy as well. There's the cost of HNS or cost of prevention, COP, financial provision for HNS. How do we facilitate it? There's the, the matter of return on investment and then just briefly share price or share prices. So yes, um, most of the delegates, if not all the delegates, are probably familiar with the COA, the direct and indirect components, the direct generally um, medical costs and wages that are covered in terms of the COID Act. And then of course the indirect costs are extensive. Lost time relative to the injured worker, other idle workers as a result of the incident or accident, uh, management and supervisory time, uh, time spent by first aiders, damaged plant equipment, tools and materials. Uh, just think of a cubic meter of concrete that was in a bucket, which bucket became unhooked as such and crashed to the ground. Incidental costs due to disruption, loading of assessments, reduced activity, idle planning equipment, legal action, and there's been an increase in that as a matter of interest. Penalties uh, due to late completion of a project as a result of, say, uh, an accident, overheads in general, funeral costs, uh, organizations may be pressured by workers to, to sponsor them. The negative image, and that is not always easy to quantify, um, however, organizations are not going to be attractive to potential clients if they are known to generate accidents uh, or as I refer to them, failures of management, loss of goodwill, the opportunity cost and reduced equity in the form of reduced share prices. Quite a lot of research work has been conducted over decades and uh, most of the research findings were documented in the early 90s. The references are included at the end of the presentation. So they're accessible. I can assist delegates if they wish to acquire certain references, but Levitt and Samuelson uh, is a textbook. So I, I cannot supply you with a textbook. So anyway, uh, Jimmy Hensey, a very well-known researcher, probably the construction health and safety researcher in the existence of, of planet Earth, um, recorded findings based upon research conducted in the USA, and that was published by Levitt and Samuelson, or referred to in their title, Construction Safety Management. And of course, given that the United States of America was the focus, there's the cost uh, of including liability claims and the cost excluding liability claims. But the point is, is that in the case of excluding the cost of liability claims, the indirect cost was greater for non-lost time than for lost time accidents. And in the case of including the cost of liability claims, the indirect cost was greater for lost time as opposed to non-lost time. And then a further study conducted uh, by the University of Washington while Jimmy Hensey was based there um, the indirect cost was five times the direct cost for injuries costing less than 50 US dollars and only 1.6 times the direct cost for non-minor injuries. 
And then the Construction Industry Institute in the United States of America, you can see published way back in 1991, they uh, determined, contended, argued, whatever, that the indirect cost is 20 times the direct cost. In the case of, of South Africa, uh, relative to my PhD study, I determined the indirect cost to be 14.2 times the direct cost. Now that was courtesy of general contractors and I conducted a number of surveys relative to my PhD. Uh, those were in fact the good old days, the late 90s in South Africa. Um, contractors were highly responsive. There was uh, more than a fair amount of work uh, being undertaken. So what I have done over decades is undertaken uh, cost of accidents research uh, at various stages during the history of the presentation of our construction management program, in fact, it's the 50th year thereof in 2021, we had a five-year program. So we had fourth and fifth year uh, BSc uh, building management students undertaking work while they were studying. Uh, that is during their fourth and fifth years of study. So this first case here, the glass chip in the eye, is courtesy of one of those students and you can see it was published in, in 1995 in the South African Institute of Building that was his uh, papers. So what transpired, um, a, a glazier and his assistant were required to reglaze a galvanized steel window. Um, the glazier uh, stepped away for a while and the assistant removed the broken glass and not wearing safety goggles, of course, um, a small chip of glass lacerated uh, his left eye. And he, the said student then, based upon an investigation, because he was employed by the said employer, was able to determine the cost. Now, please remember this is uh, in the 90s. So a doctor's consultation fee and medication at the time was 55 Rand. You can see that the indirect costs there total in um, 341.54, which includes a 10% of the direct and indirect uh, in the form of an opportunity cost. Because that time and money that was spent could have been used productively. So I just, we added on 10%. The total cost there being 396.54 cents. Now it's not the actual rent because we after the ratios between direct and indirect and more about that in a subsequent slide. Case two, in a sister uh, a company as such to the one which case one uh, spawned, a sprained toe, a garage door rigger tripped over and stuck his left big toe against a steel cable lying on the workshop floor, which at the time was covered in steel offcuts, cables and door mechanisms. So poor housekeeping. Riga experienced pain, reported the incident, uh, which occurred in the late afternoon. Now we can see here yeah, we have direct costs this time. The doctor's consultation and x ray, 133.14. Wages, um, which were sponsored, of course, by the compensation insurer, 280. And there's a total of 41314. The indirect costs, once again, uh, 81853 which included an opportunity cost 111 rand point down is in the total there of 1231.67. And so the big issue here, as, as stated, is we determine what are the ratio or what is the ratio between direct and indirect cost. But of course it depends on the type uh, or, or the type of injury uh, etc. So we can see in the case of the glass chip in the eye, 6 Rand 21 indirect to 1 Rand direct. In the case of the spraying toe, 1 Rand 98 uh, to, to 1 Rand direct. Now, the spraying toe was a more expensive accident, but the ratio is, is less. So it's the lesson. It's the, it's always our uh, interest is a contribution of the COA to the cost of construction. Now, various researchers globally, and they're not many, have endeavored to determine this contribution, that is of the cost of accidents to, to construction, just as we've endeavored to determine what the cost of prevention 
constitutes as a percentage of project cost and value. But anyway, the business roundtable in the United States of America at the time, 1995, 6.5% of the value of completed construction. The health and safety executive in 1997, and it was based on, I think, a supermarket project, 8.5% of tender price. My PhD study, 2.1% of project value. And although that was a finding relative to my PhD, I wasn't, as we say, happy with it. Um, based upon uh, research conducted in the UK, uh, this was courtesy of the Movement for Innovation. You can see back in 2003, indirect costs, 11 times the direct costs. My PhD research, 14.2 times the directed costs. In 2002, the total estimated compensation insurance for the construction industry was 200.1 million. Now, I used the Movement for Innovations, shall we say, a lower multiplier, and my, shall we say, higher multiplier to uh, evolve a potential range. So 11 to 14.2. You can see uh, the COA could have been uh, between 2.4 is it billion and um, 3.04 billion. Um, but yes, the, the big issue then is, so what does uh, or did that constitute of the value of construction work competed in the year 2002 and using the, the South African Reserve Bank's quarterly uh, bulletins, uh, I estimated the cost of accidents could have been between 4.3% and 5.4%. And in fact, the approximate percentages uh, were included in the Construction Industry Development Board's Health and Safety Status Report published on the 11th of June. 2009. Um, some more uh, findings, this in terms of the impact of inadequate H&S, and this study was courtesy of construction project managers, um, and you, could, you will note it was uh, conducted in 1996 and the findings published in 96. So Yes, uh, productivity predominates in terms of the impact of inadequate HNS, 87.2%, quality uh, 80.8, cost 72.3, client perception 68.1. So please note that's the majority, more than two thirds of respondents, the environment 66 and project schedule or time 57.4. The big issue courtesy of that study was that 96% of CPM stated that inadequate or the lack of h &S increases overall project risk. And of course, clients are, are very nervous. Um, and and in, in general, I can assure you they're nervous of contractors. Um, so another major challenge. Um, of course, well-known uh, construction h &S researchers such as Rowlandson argue that it cannot h &S performance cannot be measured in economic terms, only in social terms. And it's highly unlikely that I need to convince uh, not even a single delegate attending this webinar today. Um, so it needs to be based upon the appropriate level, economic, political, and social considerations. And so relative to the role of religion in occupational health and safety, we must remember that Allah, Buddha, and God do not go on holiday. And therefore, we uh, mere humans uh, cannot put a value on a human's life. So we, we just need to be conscious and mindful thereof. But nevertheless, research conducted in the USA, once again, courtesy of the Business Roundtable, the COP uh, equates to 2.5% of direct labor costs. Now, the challenge of direct labor costs is the structure of the industry has changed and most general contractors hardly employ direct labor. At the time, I took a stab at it as, as such, and, um, and I said, well, direct labor costs approximately 25% of project value at the time, and therefore the cost of prevention could be 0.65%. This is some time ago. Um, Tang and co-authors in, in, in Hong Kong, they determined contractors set aside 0.5%, um, and in fact, some of them less than 0.25%, a uh, quarter percent of project value. 
in the early 90s, I uh, fulfilled the function of H&S consultant to Stocks and Stocks East Cape. And the MD was actually ex Marion Roberts EP. And I'm also worked for, for Marion Roberts EP in my day. Uh, he was a very mature, shall I say, uh, MD. And, and he really wanted to determine what health and safety cost. But uh, as you can see, at the time, they were very committed to h and um, They were busy with 16 projects. And uh, the, the lowest star, h and star grading at the time was three. And they certainly did achieve three five-star BIFS h and gradings while I was working with them. And at the time, we determined that h and cost 0.22%. So almost a fifth. Of, of, of a percent of a more recent study conducted by one of my BSc honors uh, quantity surveying students, although I'm, I'm based in the Department of Construction Management, I do assist the Department of Quantity Surveying periodically. And Roxy Milan there uh, consulted the uh, executive director, if I'm not mistaken, the ECMBA, I shouldn't say who it is and then the chairperson of the Association of South African Quantity Surveyors in Eastern Cape. And you can see five general contractors and four consulting quantity surveyors. So this is the age old question, how much does health and safety cost the, the COP? And we can see GC uh, one, half a percent, GC two between one and 2%, GC three between one and two, GC four, uh, uh, three and a half and GC five sixty eight percent. We can see the Q consulting QS is there. QS one two to five. QS two two to five. QS three unsure. QS four unsure. And of course, I never comment re unsure. Um, natural provision for H and S. Now this is a major challenge. And um, in my day, I've lobbied the Joint Building Contracts Committee. Um, I've been working uh, quietly. With, with other associations and groups. And at one stage, this matter was escalated to the Construction Industry Development Board. Um, there are a number of issues, but first of all, in terms of the construction regulations, we all know a client needs to be able to uh, make a scientific assessment of the principal contractor's provision for h and <coughs> Excuse me, the client's designer and contractor h and specifications and the designer report should provide a reference to the client, uh, the construction project manager, if there is one, uh, and the consulting quantity surveyor or the cost engineer, if there is one. The h and plan should provide a reference, but remember that plan is applied from date of commencement and we do not have a requirement for pretender h and plan. So it's very challenging um, but of course, the requirement the client needs to ensure the principal contractor has made adequate provision for HS amplifies the need for a pretender HS plan. Now, imagine if we amended the construction regulations to reflect that requirement, that will create a, a, a whatever. Obviously, each project is unique, and therein lies the challenge a provisional, some will not do justice. And Principal contractors and contractors or subcontractors have varying levels of expertise, and we know the challenges relative to micro contractors and SMMEs. Now, Professor Imuzi and I have conducted extensive research, collaborative research over a long period of time. Uh, this, the findings of this particular study were presented at a conference in the United States of America, and we presented a number of statements to. Uh, potential respondents, and they're required to indicate the extent to which they uh, disagree or agree, that's concurrence, uh, relative to the statement. So the, the mean score between one and five, one's the lower point, five's the upper point. Um, competitive tendering without reference to h and marginalizes h and so 4.09 out of five. So more agreement than disagreement. Contractors are afforded the opportunity to price h and on an equitable basis, 2.36, uh, more disagreement than agreement. Contractors afforded to price items, including the h and specifications, equitable basis, same mean score, more disagreement than agreement. 
contract document enabled financial provision for HS promotes HS 4.36 more agreement than disagreement. The detailed HS section should be included in the preliminaries more agreement than disagreement, and a provisional sum should be provided for HS in the preliminaries 3.64 more agreement than disagreement. So, yes, as we say in the classics, if you haven't conducted research, uh, do not debate the issue. So a number of us have spent um, many, many months uh, gathering data and obviously reaching conclusions and evolving recommendations. But the broad community, construction community, and especially contracting sector in South Africa has a preference for detailed H&S preliminary. Oh, my consultancy create you can see the, the, the copyright date at the bottom of the slides, 2003. We evolved uh, recommended uh, H&S preliminaries as such uh, in 2003 already. And yes, um, the reality is that in cases, contractors may have to make use of H&S consultants. But if you look at this first slide, slide number 18, there are obviously issues because, for example, the design of temporary works may need to be outsourced. The design of permanent structures is such on time. Suspended scaffolds and platforms, engineering, design, and or certification. The contractor cannot do it. They've actually got to pay uh, an engineering consultant to do that. Similarly, medicals are undertaken by professional uh, health nurses or occupational medical practitioners, biological monitoring, environmental measurement, education and training, for example, even if the client provides the uh, health and safety induction as Anglo-American projects did. Uh, I, in my time, when visiting Cision, uh, would attend such h &S induction. While your workers are sitting there, they're not working for you as the contractor. So these are very real costs. And, um, and, and the list is extensive, as you can see on slide 19. You can peruse this in your own time. I really do not want to bore you by PowerPoint. Um, the facilities related requirements, till we as the South African construction industry actually record the requirements in H&S preliminaries, they are not going to be priced accordingly and they're not going to be provided. And yes, some of you will ask me, John, have you seen a shower on site? I think in my 30 plus years, um, I might have seen two projects that had showers uh, available for workers on site. That's in the Republic of South Africa. Other countries, I've got beautiful photos, trust me. Um, and you can see the list in terms of, of uh, H&S preliminaries is extensive. So, so that was uh, my shopping list uh, at, at the time. More recently, Roxy Milan, <coughs> excuse me, relative to her BSc Honours Quantity Surveying Treatise Research Project, interrogated this issue. You'll notice that there are three columns in Table 3. There's the General Contractor column, there's the Quantity Surveyor column, and then there is a Mean. Uh, column, um, which, which reflects the, the number and the percentage. Now, the 39 are the total number of proposed h and preliminaries. So, Roxy's study was qualitative and quantitative. So, she undertook a self-administered questionnaire survey and she conducted interviews. It was probably more than a BSc honors level study, certainly a coursework master's level study, but it was wonderful because we secured wonderful findings, as we say. So there was a, a mean score, uh, as you, you, you can see, uh, it's not actually, um, well, the mean score range is reflected in the first column. So it was between one and seven, not one and five. And I've defined the range. The important issue um, delegates is you'll notice that 56.4% in the extreme right-hand column of, of responses uh, were relative to the range 5 point greater than 5.2, less than equal to 6.41.
So it's more than important to very, very important uh, that those uh, H&S preliminary items are included. Um, and then 23.1%, very important to extremely, extremely important. So that's a total 31 out of 39. Um, and here you can uh, see table 4A, and if you view the mean column, you can see first aid and h &S plan are ranked joint first, followed by PPE third, which is not unexpected. Uh, hoarding and or public walkways, joint fourth with storage for flammable goods uh, in accordance with regulation 27B. Risk assessment is ranked sixth. So yes, we could interrogate if we had the time, the difference in mean scores between the general contractors and quantitative I would expect there to be a difference as researchers, we expected it to be. You can see first aid, the mean score for general contractors is 6.77 vis-a-vis the QS's mean score 6.44. Let's move on to the latter part of it. Uh, number 39 there, uh, you can see living accommodation is ranked last, uh, a mean mean score 4.65. So certainly there's support uh, uh, in terms of the importance of the inclusion of, of various h &S related items in an h &S preliminary step. So what's the return on investment? Well, um, so once again, back to my, my 1995 as published study, that glass chip in the eye, uh, the glazer's assistant wasn't wearing goggles, and you can see there, um, Polycarbonate uh, lens goggles at the time would have cost two rand ninety nine, and if we deduct it from, I think it was the total cost of accidents and express uh, the sum as a percentage of the original investment, the return on investment there thirteen thousand one hundred and sixty two percent. So, does health and safety cost money? Absolutely not, particularly when things go wrong when you didn't, and you didn't do what you should have done. This re, uh, other study was um, a more challenging one. I think it was courtesy of a fifth year, final year study excursion to Johannesburg in the 90s again. There was a very dodgy staircase. I, I genuinely cannot remember the name of the contractor, um, but it was 10 stories. And the one student as part of his uh, study excursion project uh, undertook this exercise. Uh, it's basically the productivity returns on h &S interventions. And he estimated if there were 50 artisans, 100 assistants, and they descend and ascend the staircase on average um, seven times a day for 40 weeks and an average height of five stories. In other words, if they want to attend to, to nature, that's the toilet, or to fetch materials, whatever. So the unsafe staircase, which was visible, there were no guardrails, there was no lighting, it was partially bricked up, there were obstructions. And the lost productivity was computed to be 47,443 Rand. And the said fifth year student based that on it taking eight seconds longer on average to ascend or descend the floor. However, the said student, and correctly so, uh, computed that the cost of a safe staircase would have been 14,949 Rand. So when you deduct the cost of the safe staircase uh, from the loss of productivity and express it as a percentage uh, of investing, the cost of investing safe staircase, you can see once again, there's a return of 217%. A further study, Lorraine Townhouse Complex in, in Port Elizabeth, um, in general, there was a team that was undertaking the uh, construction of the roof structure. A carpenter, two semi-skilled and four general workers. They're using a skill saw and an angle grinder. It would take two days approximately to erect the roof trusses and uh, three days the roof covering. There's 77 units. The non-productive time because of the lead breaking. Now, now, I know because I had to make this decision as a contracts manager and more when working for MNREP. Do you buy a domestic lead or do you buy a, a three-core uh, cab tire, uh, uh, sorry, a normal lead 
or do you buy a, a neoprene rubber sheath lead? Now, this is the problem or the trap that contractors fall into. So a normal lead, which I have a, a, such an extension lead in, in my uh, garage at home, at the time, 351 rand and 12 cents. But the ideal lead, the appropriate lead, 100 meter neoprene rubber sheath. So that means it, it could lie in water, although it shouldn't. But 753, 154. But this is the playoff, you see, uh, that all contractors are faced with. So what happened in reality on this complex? And I said to the fifth year student, I said, you've got to be joking. It was Nicholas Luna. I've never, I haven't forgotten his name. I said, this cannot be happening on that project. He said, John, yes, it does. So the, the lead used to break once a day while working on the roof trusses, twice a day on the roof covering, and additional once per day on average. 30 minutes to repair and 10 minutes to warm up time. Now, some of you will say, John, this, this didn't happen. Well, as I say to, to delegates and researchers, go visit 100 projects and phone me when you're finished. Um, Non-productive cost, total there, 656 rand, 25 cents. And we said, let's say the lead malfunctions on just 20% of the 77 uh, units. So that's a total of 10,160. And, and then once again, we express that loss um, um, as a, a percentage of the difference in cost between the two extension leads. And there we end up with 2,511%. The next one, very simple, you, wearing safety goggles. Remember this dates back to the 90s. We were still fighting with people really not wearing hard hats in the industry, let alone goggles and, and hearing protection. Um, so in essence, a worker was hacking uh, cement plaster, existing cement plaster of, of walls, brick walls, wasn't wearing safety goggles, basically squinting and shielding his face with a chipping hammer, 23 square meters per day. Of course, one of our fifth year students, courtesy of pain for John Smallwood, insisted on buying goggles and the, the uh, improvement in production was basically six squares per day, 29 square meters. The rate at the time for removing, chipping off uh, existing wall plaster four and fifty, and you can see uh, the improved output six squares at four fifty per square less two rand ninety nine over two rand ninety nine eight hundred and three percent return on investment. But FEM and delegates, if you cannot quantify this, it's difficult to argue, and it takes a lot of hard work to implement um, the benefits or productivity improvement as a result of h &S interventions. This was a, a, an improvement scenario that I evolved. In fact, I think it was prior to 2003 and FEM just remained calm. Or uh, I think your, your predecessors know that rate at the time for the building um, sector, two rand 20 per hundred rand wages. And the claims ratio, I would hope everyone knows it's claims expressed as a percentage of assessments. The respective uh, rebates and loadings at the time, it may still be the case. And then at the time I computed uh, in 1992, uh, 2,200 rand per 1 million rand cost of And I assumed at the time, based on the uh, stats essays, quarterly wage statistics, that wages constituted 27% of turnover. So in other words, for every 1 million rand construction completed in South Africa, 270,000 rands worth of wages were paid. And I then was able, because of that uh, 2 rand 20, um, I was able to determine what the approximate assessments paid per 1 million rand turnover in the industry. So 5,812. I then used my PhD multiplier 14.2. And I said, let's be conservative. 50% of that, uh, 7.1 rounded off to seven times. We know the direct costs of the comp equal the compensation claim. So, <coughs> excuse me, in table five, I evolved um, the total cost of accidents for various claims ratios, contractor A, B, C, and D. You can see 50%, 75%, 100%. I know it may be higher, the 100% and the B is higher, 75%. You can see the assessments just initially are, are constant 
the same amount of assessments, 581, two per 1 million rand. And there you can see the, the claims because of the differing claims ratios. Um, you can see the indirect costs multiplier kicks in. And this is one of the key issues, uh, FEM and delegates, that, that indirect cost multiplier. So you can see um, the total cost of accidents is, is obviously half, but it's 23,248 versus 46,496. That's A versus C per 1 million rand turnover. Table six then evolves scenarios for contractors with a different claims ratio. So you can see for, for 2 billion rand, um, uh, contractor C with 100% claims ratio would have been 92.99 uh, million rand. So it, it's, it's nice to table it and you can pay. Uh, but, it, but it becomes more interesting when you endeavor to determine what the impact of rebates and loadings and the indirect cost of accidents is on gross profit for delivering claims ratio. So table seven, contractor A, B, and C, but I added D, who's now a, shall I say, a good uh, health and safety contractor, claims ratio of 24%. FEM, please do not have a heart attack, or delegates, please do not have a heart attack. So the bidding cost is constant because the gross bid there is, is, is 1 million rand, and I assumed a 5% markup, which of course, as we currently know, it's not the case. So their bidding cost is constant. Their five, the 5% markup is constant. The initial cost is constant. Um, and the gross profit before the rebate loading indirect cost of accidents is constant. However, now uh, the rebate and loading kicks in. And you can see that um, A, A and D actually receive um, a rebate. So, so their gross profit now increases, whereas B and C's has now decreased. Um, the indirect cost of accidents multiplier kicks in, and of course it applies to all four, A, B, C, and D, however, less so to, to D uh, and, and, and A, but certainly uh, the least impact in the case of, of D. We can see now the gross profit has, has changed, and in fact, the gross profit percentages instead of 5% are now 2.97, 1.71, 0.45, and 4.28. And, and in fact, in the last uh, row, I actually uh, presented an improvement or decrease in markup percentage. So this, this really gives you an idea of how you can negatively impact the bottom line through accidents and more specifically, the indirect cost of accidents. Now, in terms of the big picture, this, this one's the biggest one in the history of the South African built environment it, in, in Yaka Bridge Collapse, Bushbuck Ridge, uh, in, in Mapumalanga province, July 1980, 1998. There were 14 dead bodies, seven VKE, the consulting engineering practice, and seven um, Concor uh, dead bodies as such. And then in, in 2015, that very well-known M1 motorway temporary bridge collapse, which regrettably two people lost their lives and there was major, I think, physical disability in the case of at least one. But of course, the outcome of failures of management as such uh, is fortuitous and a lot more people could have been killed. But as I say, tragically, two people were killed. Even one fatality is, is of course, one too many. What's the reality uh, of such um, events? So we can see in the case of the M1 motorway, uh, the company's share price dropped sharply by 7.32% to 11 Rand 15, leaving it 48.3% lower than a year ago. So you'll notice this is all referenced and it's not very easy. And fortunately over decades, I've kept newspaper cuttings and uh, magazine articles. In the case of the Yarka bridge collapse, and I have the original uh, newspaper copy of it rather, the share price slipped from 15 Rand 30 to 12 Rand 50, a drop of 18.3%. So 
there we go. Um, what happens on site um, is reflected on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And, and that's real the reality. And in previous presentations, um, addressing the role of health and safety in the business of construction, unfortunately, most uh, researchers and interested people, shall we say, focus on projects, but not on the role of h &S in the business of construction. And I, I've even conducted uh, a study, the role of h &S in relative to marketing. And I, I can share those findings if anyone's interested. This is the, uh, and of course, it's the challenging uh, part of construction uh, health and safety. So what are the key points? Never mind the actual percentages and the workers' compensation rate at the time and what it is now, whatever. h &S costs money in the form of COP. However, there is a return of investment. You've seen it there, courtesy of the safety goggles uh, and, and other interventions. They're phenomenal returns from minor investments in h &S. and And remember, the, these are the financial returns. Uh, we, we haven't gone and asked the workers, how do you feel? Do you feel more respected? That's another whole issue. The um, qualitative um, uh, aspects as such. The indirect costs are substantially more than the direct costs, whatever they are. Uh, the cost of accidents is greater than the cost of prevention. The indirect cost of accident multiplier effect amplifies minor reductions in the direct CO as a result of investing in h &S. Um, accidents contribute substantially to the cost of construction. And when we factor in rework, which uh, constitutes 13% of the value of completed construction and poor productivity in, in South African construction and globally, I think our rate of productivity, I speak under correction, but is it 50%? I'm not sure. Uh, Multi-factor uh, uh, productivity, not just labor productivity. So yes, and when we are experiencing, um, shall we say, lean times in terms of the national economy and the construction economy, contractors just cannot afford um, failures of management in the form of accidents and rework, that is non-conformances and rework and poor productivity. There's, there's just no cushion. Uh, because markups are, are less than 5% at the moment. Um, h and has a synergistic impact on other performance measures. Financial provision for h and must be facilitated uh, as an industry norm. I, I left out the as. And the Construction Industry Development Board should have, and this is a challenge to them, should have uh, developed a standard, therefore. Uh, not that the Master Builder South Africa and SAFSEC could not have done it. h and impacts on the business of construction through, among other, the share price of a firm. What should delegates do? This is the takeaway slide. Remember, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Interventions determine the COP relative to all types of projects. Um, a, a, a macro, or um, just now someone accuses me of promoting macro, but uh, a hypermarket differs from a 55-story building in, in Santon um, in terms of managing health and safety. Uh, monitor the COA for different types of injuries, um, and, and the minor injuries will surprise delegates. That is, the in, in terms of the indirect costs. Quantify the return on investment. So that when you debate with management as a health and safety practitioner, you must know as we say, your bricks and blocks. You must be able to quantify it. Um, there are challenges. If anyone knows, I know. Um, I, I've, I've been researching the financial mechanics and dynamics uh, of h and as, as I say, since at least 1992. And, and I specialized in health and safety as a construction manager while in the employer of MNR EP. So I know it's challenging but we can research it. It's researchable. We just need to commit ourselves. 
opportunities. Uh, um, the presenter, that is, that is me, and a co-researcher can assist or conduct collaborative research with individuals or organizations wishing to do so. So the other references I, I can assist you should you wish to acquire them, there's some of them, and they're relatively extensive. And thank you to FEM for this opportunity to share uh, the findings that I've shared and a major thank you to hundreds, if not thousands of industry respondents over uh, actually nearly three decades now. So, so they know who they are. Some of them may uh, are probably listening to this presentation today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Smallwood. Um, we just had a couple of comments in the chat that came through. So from Shamanga, uh, so important to have shower, but we, what can we do for employers to provide? And that was responded by Hendrik to say the cost of health and safety is also, no, my apologies. Hendrik's response to that uh, comment was uh, that he's heard that it's not, there's not enough water to supply in La Palale to supply the number of showers that are required in terms of the CR of Mudupi uh, during the peak construction legislation is not always feasible. And another comment again from Hendrik, uh, the cost of health and safety is also influenced by what is meant by health and safety. If it's poor design, the cost of the designer should also be uh, factored in. Um, I have not seen any questions that have been posed directly for Professor Smallwood. Uh, Hayes, can you just do a final check for me? Yeah, those were the only ones that came through. Thanks, Leander. Okay, if there are no questions for the panel, I'd like to firstly say thank you to all of them for being present today. And just to summarize what was discussed today. So from Craig, it was really encouraging to see that our economies are more resilient than what we previously forecasted by different researchers. Um, whilst we note that the highest risk right now with regards to economic impact is the rollout of the vaccine, um, which will obviously impact economic recovery. Uh, there's a decrease as well in demand of office space and an increase in the demand for residential property. I think that gave some nice insight as to what the direct impacts are to the construction industry. And we then had Professor uh, Imuze also gives some, some really insightful information about the importance of employers building a strong safety culture and also a culture of accountability than, uh, rather than blame. Um, I think with the pandemic and the changes that everybody has faced with the work pressures have changed. And unfortunately, some of those have overridden health and safety concerns where people are taking shortcuts. But we hope that all the employees that are here today will take away from today to just, you know, the importance of building a strong uh, safety culture within the organizations. And then finally, we had uh, Professor Smallwood who gave very insightful information and data on the direct and indirect costs of, of accidents. So outside of reduced productivity, the, you know, the people should just loss of goodwill generally and legal, uh, and legal action, which has resulted um, from the changes and from accidents as well. Um, the, I think for me, what I took out is the lack of health and safety increases the cost of projects. And whilst we cannot quantify the cost of a human life, it's important that we always take note of the cost of accident will always be higher than the cost of prevention. As FEM, as we continue to promote and champion health and safety, we hope that those that are on the, on the webinar today will also try and champion um, health and safety pre prevention in the organizations as well. Uh, in closing, I'd like to remind you that for those of you that like to claim the SIRE CBT, CBD points, please click on the icon, the SIRE icon on the invite, and then you can load your details online, and then the points will be automatically allocated to you. I'd like to thank you again all for attending and, help, and helping us uh, make this event successful. Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Enjoy your day. We Goodbye. will post the we will post the we will share the presentation for today with everyone. Thank you.